Trench and excavation activities occur regularly throughout the U.S. and is considered one of the most dangerous work activities in the construction industry. There are many hazards associated with this type of work, but no hazard is more dangerous nor have the higher possibility of causing the death than cave-ins. So we must always do what we can to protect our workforce from cave-ins, and we can accomplish this by either using shielding and or shoring. Hi, I'm Sergio with a &H Safety, and in this video we will be covering the protective system shielding and shoring used to protect workers from cave-in hazards. There are several types of protective systems that can be used to protect employees from deadly cave-ins. Shielding and shoring are two such methods. Shoring or shielding is used when the location of the depth of the trench makes sloping back to the maximum allowable slope impractical. So, what is the difference between shoring and shielding? Well, let's talk about it. Shoring systems are used to support the face of the excavation to prevent movement of soil, underground utilities, roads, and foundations. There are different types of shoring systems available and will consist of posts, wells, struts, or cross bracings and sheeting. Basically, shoring involves placing boards or other bracing against the excavation walls and maintain separation between the boards with the post, screw jack, or hydraulic cylinder. The trend today is leaning towards the use of hydraulic shoring, a prefabricated strut and or well system manufactured of aluminum or steel. One reason that these systems are becoming more and more popular is the fact that hydraulic shoring provide a critical safety advantage over timber shoring because workers do not have to enter the trench to install or remove the system. In addition to the safety advantages, if that wasn't enough reason to choose the type of system, hydraulic shoring has other advantages such as being light enough to be installed by one single worker. They are gauge regulated to ensure that there is even distribution of pressure along the trench line. They can have the trench faces preloaded to use the soil's natural cohesion to prevent movement. And they can be easily adapted to various trench depths and widths. Hydraulic shoring should be checked at least once per shift for leaking hoses and or cylinders, broken connections, cracked nipples, bend bases, and any other damaged or defective parts. And no matter the shoring system used, they should all be installed from the top down and removed from the bottom up. We also have pneumatic shoring which works in a manner similar to hydraulic shoring, but the main difference between them is that pneumatic shoring uses air pressure in place of hydraulic pressure. Screw jack struts may also be used. Screw jacks are a type of system that is most commonly used in timber shoring. They differ from both hydraulic and pneumatic systems and that the struts of a screw jack system must be adjusted manually, creating a hazard for the worker who has to enter the trench and adjust the strut. In addition, uniform preloading cannot be achieved with this system and the weight of it creates handling difficulties. And finally, we have timber shoring, which you can tell from the name, requires a ton of lumber, especially in the bigger cuts, and are custom built to fit the trench. Deep and long trenches are probably better suited for timber shoring and is suited well for excavations where significant time will be spent in one area. For those applications where the working area of an excavation is constantly moving, such as laying a conduit or piping, shielding systems or trench boxes are better suited. The selection and installation of the lumber for timber shoring wall differ, depending on the type of soil you're working with. There are six tables you can follow for this, two for each soil type. So you must first determine the soil, Use the appropriate tender that corresponds to that type of soil and follow it accordingly to determine the size of your lumber and spacing of the members. And these tables can be found in Appendix C of OSHA's requirements for protective systems. Great, now that we covered the different shoring systems and how they can be used to support an excavation walls and prevent cave-ins from occurring, let's move on to shielding. Shielding systems are very popular and frequently used as a form of trench protection. They offer excellent protection that can be quickly put in place with the minimum of the disruption to the area surrounding the trench. These systems are structures that are able to withstand the forces imposed on it by a cave-in and thereby protect the employee within the structure. Shielding systems are designed to be moved as the trench is being excavated and successive sections of pipe are being laid. Because of this, the trench needs to be approximately four inches wider than the shield. Obviously, since the walls of the shield are not in constant contact with the walls of the trench, the trench walls gain no strength from the pressure of the shield system. Therefore, the purpose of the shield system is not to prevent a wall collapse, but rather to protect the workers inside the structure when it does collapse. The shield must be able to withstand the potential stresses placed upon it and must be installed in a way which prevents lateral movement during an impact. Now the strength of the shield system and the depths to which it can be used in various types of soils should be documented upon an accompanying tabulated data sheet. This sheet should come from either the manufacturer or registered professional engineer. And this data must be on the job site during the use of the shield. It is very important that the shield system is assembled and used in accordance to the manufacturer's or registered professional engineer's direction. If you use a job built shield system, be sure that it is either designed by a registered professional engineer or it is in compliance with tabulated data approved by a registered professional engineer. The way the trench box is installed and moved varies on the types of soils. In type A soil, the trench is dug and the shield is lowered in. As the trench is lengthened, 
the shield is pulled horizontally down the trench. And as the shield is moved, the area where the work is completed should be immediately backfilled. In type B and C soils, the weakness of the wall indicates the trench to be excavated within the shield. As buckets of soil are removed, the sides of the shields are tamped down into the excavation until the proper depth has been reached. Now in this scenario, we are laying pipe so when the next section of pipe is to be laid, the shield is pulled up so that one end is still at the bottom of the trench while the other is reclining on the slope of the excavation. Again, the high end is tamped down as buckets of soils are being removed from within the shield. When the shield is moved, the area where the work is finished should be immediately backfilled as well. It is also important to note that workers must exit the shield when it is being installed, removed or moved vertically, or when loads are being moved above or within the shield. However, they may remain in the shield when it is being moved horizontally. Most trench shields are relatively short and they can be stacked onto one another to accommodate deeper trenches, only if they have been designed to do so. And always ensure that the shield system extends at least 18 inches above the trench wall. In addition, adequate egress systems must be provided to allow for entry into shield systems, such as ladders. Workers must not enter an unprotected area of the trench in order to reach their means of egress. Secure ladders must be spaced so that a worker does not have to go further than 25 feet laterally in order to reach the ladder. And remember, climbing on the shield system is not an acceptable form of egress. Workers may also excavate the bottom of the trench to a depth which is not greater than two feet below the bottom of the shield if the shield is rated for the entire depth and there is no sign of soil loss from the sides or bottom. When shielding systems are damaged, they need to be repaired and inspected before being returned to service. If repairs are minor and cosmetic and the structure integrity of the shield is unaffected, the competent person can approve the shield's return to service. However, if structural repairs are made, a registered professional engineer must evaluate these repairs before the shield is returned to service. And there you have it, shoring and shielding systems, which are two methods that can protect workers from cavings. We hope this video has given you a better understanding of what shielding and shoring systems are and how they differ from one another and how they can protect our workforce from cavings. Be sure to stay tuned for our next videos where we'll cover the other two protective systems you may use to protect your employees from cavings, sloping and benching. If you have any questions or need assistance with your safety program, feel free to contact us using the information provided below. I want to hear from you guys in the comments below. Do you work with trench and excavations? What protective system does your company use most frequently? And lastly, follow us on all social media platforms to stay updated with our latest safety tips and tricks. And as always, until next time, be safe and thank you.